So after Alexander, you better move on. 1961 at the old location. Correct. Wilson Dam Highway location. That was the only hit that was recorded there. Uh, it was an old tobacco and candy warehouse that uh, he just moved into, set up his recording equipment, and uh, uh, found Arthur through a friend of his and uh, went in and recorded You Better Move On and A Shot of Rhythm and Blues. Nice. And You Better Move On was the A side, A Shot of Rhythm and Blues the B side. Uh, you Better Move On became a big hit. I think it was top 10. And uh, the, the Stones covered one side and the Beatles covered the other. I think the Beatles co covered A Shot of Rhythm and Blues and the Stones covered You Better Move On on, on one of their first records. So they were amazing. not all that well known at that time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty amazing record to think back about that. And it, that all happened off, off of uh, you know one song. And Arthur came to him with a song and couldn't play an instrument. So he just snapped his fingers and sang the song. And uh, he so brought- So your dad wrote the song with him? Well, no, no. He just brought in he brought in his his band that he worked with, yep. and they just recorded it. And who were the guys then? Who were the players? It then? was uh, Terry Thompson, who was uh, a guitar player, Norbert Putnam, Jerry Kerrigan, David Briggs, Peanut Montgomery. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And those so those guys went on to become the first rhythm section here, and and uh, recorded the Tams, Jimmy Hughes, and several others. Uh, and then they, they moved to Nashville, and at that point it's when the, uh, the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section guys came in, which was uh, David Hood, Jimmy Johnson, Barry Beckett, Roger Hawkins, Junior Lowe, Spinner, Ola. So Jimmy Hughes, Steal Away, um, that was the first record here at the new location? So it was the first record recorded here, but it wasn't the first hit. Right. So it was recorded and stood on the shelf for four years. And they had the Tams and several other records that came in and were hits. Uh, Tommy Rowe had uh, several b big records. One of my dad's writers, Dan Penn, talked him into putting it out. So th they put it out on Fame Records. They had some pressed up. They got in, they borrowed a uh, station wagon, got in the car with a, and got a case of vodka and went around to all the ra black radio stations around the Southeast. And gave them a record and a bottle of vodka and talked them into playing the record. And by the time they got here, they back here, they had a hit record. Nice. And uh, yeah, the rest is history from there. Uh, but yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy was the first record recorded here and then it later became a hit. Yeah. Four years later, it's incredible. And then of course, Tams had a huge hit with uh, What Kind of Fool Do You Think I Am? Right, they had What Kind of Fool Do You Think I Am and Laugh It Off. And uh, there was a publisher out of Atlanta named Bill Lowry who brought them over here. And he was, he was a big influence on, my, on Muscle Shoals in the early days. He, was, he brought a lot, a lot of artists, brought Jerry Reed over here. He brought nice. uh, the Tams, uh, Joe South, uh, Tommy Rowe. So a lot, of the, a lot of the Muscle Shoals probably wouldn't have happened if not for Bill Lowry. So of course in 66, Wilson, Wilson Pickett recorded many huge songs. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mustang Sally is probably one of the most, I mean, one of the most famous songs of all time. Yeah. Um, I think I've covered that in about 50 bands. I think everybody has. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I just, you know, it, it never ends. You go, I just, you just hear that song oh, everywhere. And, and Funky Broadway, Land of a Thousand Dancers, and of course, Hey Jude. Hey Jude. Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, yep. which was in the Blues Brothers movie we yep. talked about earlier. Yep. Uh, yeah, a bunch, bunch of his hits. He had, he had a mini skirt mini. So in 66, Otis Redding recorded You Left the Water Running, but that wasn't released until 76. Right. So Otis was coming over doing production work here. He was producing Arthur Conley, who he produced Sweet Soul Music on, and uh, I Can't Stop, and several other records. But while he was here, my dad talked him into doing a demo of a song that he had written called you, with Dan Penn called you, you Left the Water Running. So Otis recorded that. A few months later, he died in the plane crash, and they went back in and added horns, and it was bootlegged out of here somehow, and came out on a record, and they it was lawsuits, and they stopped it, and then so it, it didn't come out for yeah a decade legally. So yeah, that was that was kind of how that happened, and it didn't come out digitally till much later than that. Sixty-seven, the sound of Wilson Pickett. I remember that very well. My dad had that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great record. All, all of Pickett's records were great records. Yeah. He was, he was such an records. amazing singer and screamer. My dad had run into Jerry Wexler at a party, and, and Jerry told him, if you ever find a hit artist, hit song, whatever, send it to me. So he had found 
a buddy of his had cut a record across town with you know my dad's studio guys called When a Man Loves a Woman. And he, the guy had brought it to my dad, so he called Wexler, hooked them up, and got a finder's fee on When a Man Loves a Woman. And that was how the relationship started with Atlantic. So then the next thing, uh, Wexler had been shut out of stacks, and they were going all in-house over there. So he called and wanted to bring Pickett down, and that's how Pickett got here. Incredible. And then from Pickett, went to Clarence Carter was signed, went from fame, was on fame records, and, and they picked up distribution on that. And then he brought Aretha down to do. Incredible. And she, had, she hadn't had a hit. Yet she'd had five or six albums out, maybe more than that, and hadn't had any hits on Columbia. So Wexer had signed her to Atlantic and decided to bring her down here, brought her down here, and the first two records she cut was uh, Never Loved a Man and Do Right Woman, which were her first two gold records. What's the true story about that session? <laughs> and what, in your words. Uh, what, what? The, the story that I have always been told is that uh, there was some drinking going on in the session. Uh, Aretha's husband and uh, several of the horn players were, were sharing a bottle. After a while, I think that uh, Aretha's husband felt like some of the guys were flirting with Aretha, and he said he wanted them fired, so the one guy was fired. And the session kind of went on for a little bit, and then it ended, and kind of flat, you know. But they'd already cut I Never Loved a Man, which is a hit, and they had half of Do Right Woman recorded. So my dad had a couple drinks after the session and decided to go over to the hotel and make everything right with Ted and Aretha. So when he got there, Ted had already been drinking more, and it was it just he opened the door up, and it was a a firestorm. It was it was a, it was on. There was no making up <laughs> anything. Right. And according to my dad, they were holding they were they were on the fourth floor of the downtown or in Florence, and they were holding each trying to throw each other off the balcony. So it was it was tough, and they left uh, they left the next morning, and never came back to Muscle Shoals. Oh, such a shame. Yeah, such great records. Though. Yeah, that was when I when I when I it was funny when I saw the documentary, and you can use this or not, but when I saw the documentary Muscle Shoals documentary, my I, I told my dad, I said, you know what I got away I got from that movie? He said, what? And I said, that you lost Aretha Franklin and the Allman Brothers. <laughs> Did yeah. you do that? Yeah, yeah. Of course, he did. He did just fine with with all the rest. But uh, yeah. yeah. So from that, Aretha. After Aretha, Leonard Chess called and said, "Hey, you know what? What have I got to do to get you to cut a record for me?" And he said, "Well, who you want me to cut?" And he said, "Etta James." Incredible. And she hadn't had hits in years. Uh, she'd had it last, and but she hadn't had a hit in several years. So uh, she came to Muscle Shoals, and uh, Clarence Carter had written a song called "Tell Daddy." They had put out that didn't do very well, and they decided to change it to Tell Mama. And they cut it on Edda, and it was a huge hit. Of course, I'd Rather Go Blind was the B side of that, mm -hmm. uh, which later became a yeah. classic. Amazing hit. Yeah. A classic, but it wasn't really that much of a hit on her in the beginning. But yeah, some of those records, you know, it's, it's crazy. One of those records on that uh, that was cut during that session was I Got You, Babe, the Sonny and Cher song. Incredible. And uh, it recently, it wasn't a big record then either. It recently popped up on Walmart's Christmas commercial. They just wore it out. And I'm sure you heard it, but yeah. uh, it was it was everywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, six, 50 years later, they're still still having success with those things. The Osmonds, one, uh, one Bad Apple and many, many more, 1970. How did that come about? It was a big year. So Mike Curb, who was running MGM Records at the time, contacted my dad and said, I've got a band I want you to do. And he said, who is it? And he said, I'm not telling you. <laughs> because if I tell you, you won't do it. So uh, he flew him out to Vegas to see them. They yeah. were they were playing Vegas. Uh, they had been on the Andy Williams show, so they were kind of known, but hadn't had any success. So he flew out and saw them, and they blew him away. And uh, he, he called his top songwriter, George Jackson, write me a Jackson 5 type song for the Osmonds, and so he wrote One Bad Apple, and they cut that, and it was just massive, and then from there, it was just, they sold 20 million records or something in the next couple of years. Incredible. So yeah, it was, it was, they were one of the first, you know, huge boy band type things. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was massive. 
I remember I was, you know, I was 12 years old, and I go, we'd go to see them, and it was 20,000 12-year-old girls screaming at the top of their lungs, <laughs> man. It's just like, God, I, don't, I know what I don't want to do. I don't want to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have this conversation without talking about Mac Davis, of course. Yeah. Your dad Mac. produced 12 albums with him. Yes, he did more than anybody. He uh, Mac was here all the time. He was like an uncle to me. He was uh, beautiful. He, he stayed at our house and was uh, just a great dude. He was just a great human being and a great songwriter. And uh, you know, he wrote in the ghetto and a little less conversation for Elvis and you know, just tons and tons of records. He was uh, he was an amazing guy. And uh, but yeah, he did. Baby, don't get hooked on me. Stop smell the roses. Uh, friend, wo lover, woman. Wife, rock and roll, I gave you the best years of my life. Everything he ever did, except for Hard to Be Humble, which yeah. was which was a live record. Uh, he did every every big rec other big record he ever had was done here. Yeah, twelve albums must be. They must have ended up as credible friends. Oh yeah, they were. They were great friends. Yeah, Mac, Mac uh, was at his funeral, and uh, yeah, they were really close all the way up to to the end. In seventy two, when the Dwayne Allman anthology came out, is that the time when probably a lot of the songs were heard for the first time that he recorded what in the late 60s right right yeah so they, they it had never been released a lot of that stuff was hourglass and uh early early renditions of the allman brothers uh, even before greg had joined joined in uh so yeah that was the first time a lot of that stuff had ever been released and it was probably the first time that a lot of people realized that he played on hey jude and and you know Boss Gags and all those records that he did here. Now you made a a, a kind of half junk about watching the Muscle Shoals documentary and, and said that the things that you took away from it was Dad, you lost uh, Aretha and the Allman Brothers. Right. What's the story there? I mean, how was the how were the Allman Brothers lost? In well, he so the Allman Brothers were our the Hourglass, yep. and they were signed to Liberty Records in L.A. and they were out there and they were doing like pop kind of pop, uh, psychedelic type stuff for the label, and they really didn't, wasn't into it. And they weren't playing live much. So Dwayne left LA, and and the label let him let him out of his contract. He moved here, and but they wouldn't let Greg out because he was the singer. Sure. So they kept him for another year or so, and Dwayne came here and started playing sessions, and, you know, camped in the parking lot and that whole story, and then, came in and started playing sessions and was really, you know, great and was playing on, on hit, hit records and started to get a name. And Phil Walden and my dad were friends. So Phil started managing Dwayne. And from there, you know, Dwayne, when Dwayne was here, Greg wasn't involved. So my dad had never met Greg at that point. So there was no singer. And if you ever heard Dwayne sing, it was okay, but it was not Greg. Not even close to it. So he didn't have a singer. So my dad sold his contract for ten thousand dollars to uh, to Atlantic. Oh wow! And uh, from there, it went, they they started doing. They did, did a record. I forget which record was first, but they did a record, and then then they did Fillmore East, the live record. It would just blow them up. Yeah. So is it true to say that Fame Records' biggest hit was "You're Having My Baby," Paul Anka? <laughs> <laughs> do we have to go there? <laughs> We don't have to. We don't have to talk about it. <laughs> uh, on I mean, the label itself. On the label itself. Yeah, it yeah. probably was. Huge. It probably yeah. was. Yeah, it was. It was. It sold five million records, yeah. uh, singles. Yeah. And uh, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, and you know, especially it, when everything was a dollar. You know a piece. What's, what's crazy about that record is is that it was doing it was doing pretty good, and then you know at the time there was the 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 women the women's rights movement right. going on. And they started raising hell over that record because it said, you're having my baby, not you're having our baby. Oh. So Paul Ank was kind of the first to get canceled. Right. <laughs> but all the publicity made it sell more records. So it ended up selling five million records because of, because of all the hoopla about it. And they went in and, and, and actually did a version with a different lyric uh, just for that. But it was, the record was already out and was already selling. So... Five million singles in 1974 is a heck of a hit. Yeah, yeah. But it has is, is also made some of the, the worst records of all time lists or worst songs of all time lists. Uh, just, I, you know, I don't know, whatever. It hits a, a hit, right? It hits a hit, yep, yep. 
So um, we're going to move forward to one of my personal favorites we are just talking about, of course, Jerry Reed's The Bird. Yeah. This is an absolute masterpiece. Yeah, so Jerry Reed had gotten into movies and had really put his music career on hold. He was he had done smoke, several, you know, two or three Smokey and the Bandit movies. He'd done a lot of movies and had become a big, big celebrity uh, movie star. So uh, he decided he wanted to start making records again. So he got with my dad and went in and started recording some things. The first thing they cut was Patches. It was a recut of Patches, and it did fairly well in the country market. Uh, but then he, they, he found a song called uh, She Got the Gold Mine, I Got the Shaft. <laughs> and it was a funny, funny song. And uh, <laughs> a guy named, the head of Arista Records later, named, a guy named Tim DeWall wrote that song. And uh, so they were going through songs, and, and Reed heard that song, and he said, you know that song back there, Hall? That uh, she got the gold mine thing. He said, I'll give you a hell of a reading on that one. And uh, they went in and cut it, and it was the number one record. And then from there, they went and did The Bird, and which is another funny record. And uh, it, it was a huge hit. But uh, they did they did four or five records together, and they, they became big buddies too. And and Jerry was was down here a lot and had a lot of success. Yeah, we were talking about earlier off camera. Um, you know, knowing Jerry Reed and then realizing he was the same guy in Smokey and the Band, it all just made perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, and that was him off camera. He was, he was, he was that character. He was just funny and just uh, to us, like living in the UK, he just seemed like the ultimate kind of American, kind of like American. That's like an boy, American yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, fulfilled all everything we wanted American right, guys to right. be. Great guitar player, oh, incredible guitar player. Yeah, just uh, yeah, he he was he was a good dude. Sort of almost like a, like a cowboy American ear, American kind of pioneer character. Right. Yeah, just like a man's man. Yeah, mm -hmm. Great, incredible musician. So some of the uh, um, more current stuff, Drive By Truckers. The Dirty South. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible sounding record because it's like super dry and in your face and live, like they tracked it live. Right, right, yeah. Dave Barbie did that record, great great producer, engineer. Uh, he came down and did that. We did it in this room, Studio B. Did that whole record, and Jason Isbell was part of that band at the time who was writing for us, so we, we published his, his material through through 2013. And uh, yeah, they, they did that record live and it was, it's a great record. It was one of their more successful records. Wait, the Drive-By Truckers, that's Cooley, isn't it, on guitar? Yeah. Yeah, I have, uh, do you know Scott Baxendale, the guitar maker? I don't. He makes the Cooley Caster. Uh, okay. And I have one. Yeah. It's, it's a great guitar. It's, it's Cooley and, and uh, Patterson Hood uh, are the two main guys and I've, I've known them forever. You know, Patterson's David Hood's son. Cool. So yeah, so we've we've known each other for for a long time, and uh, I used to go see them when they were a band called Adam's House Cat. Fish Records, um, part of the Fuego album, mm -hmm. uh, produced by incredible producer Bob Ezrin. Yep, Bob Bob came down and did they did they did like uh, some vocals and and horns and backgrounds. It was it was mostly overdubs, but uh, yeah, that was fun working with those guys. It was that was interesting. Bob's a, Bob's a great producer. Yeah, he's a. I've never personally worked with him, but he, I have a lot of mutual friends that have or engineered and stuff with him. They, they, they say he's a taskmaster. He master. is. Oh, he yeah. knows what he wants, and you have you have to give it to him. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. He's made some of the best sounding records of all time. So yeah, I, there's no doubt. Yeah, if you know, it, he knows if you what know, he wants, you know. You know, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, we can't miss out the fact that Greg Ullman made his, you know, his farewell album, Southern Blood. Here, he did. He did. That was uh, that was fun and. Sad at the same time, um, you know they didn't come in telling us that he was he was sick, but kind of knew that this was probably going to be his last record. And Don was produced the record. He was an amazing, amazing guy and producer, and it was it was a lot of fun though. He spent he spent uh, two weeks here and uh, just rented out both rooms and set up over in Studio B and just as kind of the the hangout and. Uh, worked in A, and uh, it was it was it was really a great experience. Uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of fun and laughter, and then you know six months later it was sad, obviously. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it's kind of kind of uh, amazing to be the bookends of the Allman Brothers' careers. 
Yeah. You know, as Dwayne started here and Greg finished here. So it's, it's, it's a great of, album as well. Yeah. It's a great yeah. album to go out and. Yeah, there's a couple tracks that didn't make the record that he didn't, he never got his vocal on. That's hated that. But uh, yeah, overall, it was it was really good. Fantastic. We did a record called Sm Muscle Show, Small Town, Big Sound. And, and that's, we did Steven Tyler and Keb Moe and Allison Krauss and uh, um, who else was on that? Vince Gill, Willie Nelson, Chris Stapleton, Jamie Johnson. Amazing. Yeah, so it was that was a lot of fun to do that do that record, bring those guys in. They all did classic Muscle Shoals records, and uh, uh, it, and, and with with the, some of the original guys from the sessions. So. Well, I wanted to ask. I mean, how did you how did your dad find those guys? What was the process? Just Musicians, the players, yeah, the Swampers. The, you everybody. know, the first the first guys he started recording with were just guys that he played. You know, they were they were he was writing songs. Working at a radio station, had a had a radio had a show that they did a lot where they played live. Their band played live, and he just started recording with his friends and his bandmates in the beginning. And you know they started getting better and better. And then when those guys left, he had already kind of started working with some other guys, which was ended up being the Swampers. And he and he worked with all of them individually. But and, how did you find it? I mean. Just round about they found, town? Yeah, yeah. I think they found him after he started having success. I see. You know, they found him. And then uh, when they when those guys left, he put on a full-on search for the Fame Gang, which was the next group. And he, he brought in people from all over the country. Uh, you know, he just, word of mouth, though, just, you know, who do you know, who do you know that's a great bass player? Who do you know that's a great keyboard player? And, uh, you know, that, that's how he'd find them. And, you know, that's how you find great musicians is ask other great musicians. The documentary talks about the influence of the local singing river mm -hmm. landscape. What, what can you sort of elaborate on that? What, what do you think that is? What does that mean to you? Sounds good. <laughs> 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 I don't know how much there is to it. What I will say about that is, you know, you look at, look at the major music towns in America and they're usually on water. And I think a lot of that has to do is back in the day before cars, that's how people travel was by paddle boats like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think music would travel by boat from those from town to town. Uh, so I, I think that... Yeah, going up the Mississippi Delta. Right. Yeah. Memphis, St. Louis, yeah. you know, Chicago. Uh, they're mostly on, on some kind of waterway. So there may be something to it that way. You know, there was, there was uh, you know, supposedly a... A, uh, there was a lot of Indian tribes in this area, and apparently some of them were musical. Uh, but again, you know, it's hard to hard to know whether that's my my dad would say it's all bullshit. <laughs> it, that it was that it was hard work and and determination is what it, what what it boiled down to. The Swampers, which were an entirely white band backing black African American musicians in Alabama in the '60s. I mean. How, how how did that come about? You had uh, you know things going on in Birmingham and other places where they were you know uh, there was a lot of racism and riots and so forth going on. But up here, the guys you know and, and, and the bands, the first two bands here were all white, completely white, and but none, and all the artists were black. Uh, but that's the music they loved. They loved that music, and it didn't matter to them. It never mattered to my dad what color anybody's skin was. It mattered how good they could play and how talented they were and how hard they would work. And that was all that mattered. And it didn't, you know, when they walked in the studio, it didn't, none of that mattered. And that's what they all say to me is, you know, we didn't never thought about it. We just didn't think about it. And they're like, I don't know why everybody wants to bring that up. We didn't even think about it. I said, that's why they want to bring it up because everybody else, yeah, you yeah. know, across the street was thinking about it. But you guys were... You know, we're just working with people that you 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 enjoyed working with. Yeah. So it's and it showed in the music. I think that's why the music was was so good. You oh, know? I agree. It was, it was a it was a, a you know people working together towards a common goal, which is something we really need today. What was the music that he loved? He loved country music, mm -hmm. and he loved New Orleans music. Mm -hmm. So I think he got a lot of inspiration from uh, music. That came out of New Orleans, but also he loved Hank Williams Sr. 
Uh, right. So I think that was kind of a mixture of the two things. You know, he was a, he was a fiddle player and a bass player. Uh, so he, he always said that his his horn parts that that he would arrange came from his fiddle playing, that they were really fiddle parts, and he just transferred them over to horns. You know, I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, I think those two things uh, had a lot to do with, it. and he just uh, he he loved Ernie Cato and. You know, a lot of New Orleans artists that, that uh, I think that kind of comes through in the music. The other thing is all those guys listen to stations out of Chicago, you know, late at night when they're coming home from gigs, they were listening to WLAC and, yeah. and you know, and that's what they were playing and that's what they, they love that stuff. And that's, that's how, you know, back in the day when radio was the thing, that's how people heard music and, 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 and found music. There's the story of... Uh, um Mustang Sally, where Tom Dowd says he took half an hour to salvage the tape because it flew out on the ground. Is that true? You know, I think it was Land of a Thousand Dances. They, it's, it's, I know it's everywhere. Yeah. It's different in every story you read. So I'm not sure, but it, listening to them, I would say it's Land of a Thousand Dances. Okay. Yeah. But it, one of those tapes. But what happened was Wexler brought down a new tape that when the tape machine stopped, it wouldn't stretch. So... They'd gotten a cut and they were running it back and it something happened with the machine and it didn't stretch. It just shattered into oh. pieces. And so Tom Dowd said, Y'all y'all just go to lunch and we'll leave me with this here for, for a while. And he spliced it all back together and that was in, ended up being the take. <laughs> yeah. But they said it was in, you know, dozens of pieces. You're saying that Wexler he was cut out of stacks? Yeah. So, uh, what's the guy's name? Because I think he, I think he says that he found uh, the New York scene had become stale. But he had started working at Stax, yeah, yeah. and it had mid, they had Midnight Hour and six three four five seven eight nine and I think Knock on Wood with Eddie Floyd, and so they had some success over there. And then um, the guys at Stax decided they just wanted they were going to do all in house. They weren't going to let anybody come in and use their studio. So he had to find another place. As Wexter says in, in some documentary, he says, the welcome mat was pulled out from under me at Stax. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So he came over here and started working. And uh, how, did he, how did he find out about the place? When a man loves a woman. Ah, right. My dad had sent that. him when a man loves a woman. Of course you said earlier, yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, so that, that was how their relationship started. Do you know what the gear would have been around this kind of period? It would have been, both the consoles would have been born, yes. built by Paul Kelly. Yes. Um, what was the one Universal in Universal Audio. Pretty similar to right. that? Right. Same, kind of, same kind of layout, except it had knobs instead of faders. Not instead of faders, right. Right. And, uh, yeah, it would, have, it would have been very, you know, Telefunken mics, Neumann mics. You know, he didn't have a lot of outboard gear at that point. Right. Nobody really did. Uh, he had know, the chambers. had the chambers. Probably not the EMTs yet. No, though. the EMTs probably came in, you know, the 70s sometime. Right. Uh, but yeah, it had four chambers at that time. Today it would be considered primitive. Right. Uh, but at the time it was fairly cutting edge, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was all about getting great performances. Yeah. You know, at that time, engineer was a, is a different animal than it is now. You had to get your part right at the same time they got their part right. You know, in the, in the very beginning when it was mono, there was no overdubbing. It was just... Well, because Spoon, Spooner's on record as saying, um, no headphones. Oh, yeah. The red light would just come on and into you'd start the, it, playing. Pretty far into the 60s, they didn't have headphones. Uh, and the original, the, the first, you better move on in some of those records, how they mixed was Peanut back up from the microphone. <laughs> and he would have, he had on the, on You Better Move On, he had an acoustic guitar on one side of the mic and the vocalist on the other side. And they would move away from the mic is how they how they mixed. So yeah, it was a, it was a different world back then. I mean, how were the arrangements created? You know, the nature of head sessions. I mean, what was the sort of procedure? Well, with with my dad, he was a charge. I mean, he was he was totally in charge. But he he believed in bringing in five musicians that all were as talented as he was that could like having five producers in the room with him, and they all just worked it out. They would just you know. Uh, start working out and talk, you know, about every tempo, about, uh, you know, should they, should we start it off with a chorus or should we, you know, do we need that bridge? Just Well, for instance, I mean, in, in respect, when uh, Aretha is working with the guys, you think, do you feel like that was a pretty accurate representation of how 
they would have come up with the song? In the movie? In the movie, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. You know, some of the things that they had some of the guys saying, just because I know those guys, yeah. I know they never would have said that. But, yeah, yeah, the basic premise of how they would play off each other, yeah, was, was yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty much right. So Quinn Ivey opened a second studio in mm -hmm. uh, Muscle Shots, um, the Roller Sound Studio, with the blessing of your dad. Right. And that, of course, is where Percy's oh. When a Man Loves a Woman was recorded um, on a two-track. I mean, presume Ivy and your dad were pretty close. If they were was, good friends, yeah. Quinn, Quinn wrote for Fame, right, uh, as well as Marlon Green, who was Quinn's partner. Uh, so they were really close. They were they were buddies, and uh, so yeah, Quinn brought him that record, and uh, and he took it to Wexford, and and my mom still gets 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 two percent or one percent off of uh, Percy Sledge to this day. Hey, off that one record. After Aretha, was that sort of the end of Jerry's and uh, Rexler's and your dad's relationship? It was. Uh, it was. I've kind of, over the last couple of years, since when the movie, Aretha movie, Respect, started, they started working on that. Yeah. I started going over the timeline. It was about, they worked together for about two more years after that. But oh, okay. it was But it was contentious. Right. It was, there was a lot of long phone calls and... Um, you know, after after the Aretha thing, it it the, the their relationship was really damaged. Over the next couple of years, though, they continued to work together. My dad still had Clarence Carter over there, uh, who who Jerry couldn't fire him from because it, contractually he was tied in. Then in in '69, the, the bombshell dropped and the Swampers left, mm -hmm. and Jerry funded them. Uh, he loaned them the money to open up Muscle Show Sound Studio, and then it, the war was the war started with right. with uh, with with those guys and with Wexer. And Wexer went over there and did, took all his work over there, and uh, worked with those guys for another ten or fifteen years, or well, on and off. Uh, but at one point, Wexer uh, was moving to Miami. He was going to move his operations to Miami. He tried to get those guys to come to Miami, and they wouldn't. And he called their loan in. And so they had to come up with with the money quick to to pay that off. So, you know, he kind of kind of double crossed them a little bit. But uh, you know, and it's strange because he I think he didn't he contend that you know part of the problem was, was that it was a white band playing with a black artist, but then he ended up funding the white band anyway. Right, successful. Well, we'll do that. Yes, yeah, success has many friends, and uh, failure has many enemies. Exactly. Yes. But they, you know, my dad and Wexter mended fences later on in life, and they. Great. They, they hung out and talked. I guess because for Aretha, she literally said that that recording was the turning point in her career. Right. Yeah. That's a pretty big statement. Pretty big statement from probably the greatest woman songwriter and singer of all time. Yeah. 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 I mean, her voice is second to none. And then they ended up going to um, Atlantic, didn't they? Finish recording with her. Right. Yeah. The, the musicians went to uh, to New York and recorded the rest of her for the next several years, several albums. Most of her major success they played they played on. So how did Little Richard end up here? You know, I'm not exactly sure how he ended up here, but uh, he came here in 1970 and he fell in love with the musicians and and uh, as a matter of fact, probably three fourths of his band for the next 30 years were Muscle Shoals guys. So he, when he left here, a lot of the musicians went on the road with him and they were with him up till the end. They, you know, he, they were all still, still, uh, you know, talking to him daily. And, and, uh, there was, you know, there was Travis Womack, uh, Kelvin Holly, Chalmers Davis, Wayne Chaney, uh, Jesse Boyce, all guys from here that played with him for decades. It's amazing. Yeah. So and he had his last hit here, Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, right. Yeah, which is his last chart record. So many players coming from here. Is there any kind of legacy left, you think, with the musicians in the town? People. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's more, you know, when I first got into the business, I looked around, which, which was about 90, 91. You know, I'd always been around it, but I didn't start working in it until about 91. And I started looking around, and it was it was... It's pretty dried up at that point. It was, it, we were publishing, was our big big forte at that time, and there wasn't a lot of a, 
a lot of young talent around. There wasn't any. <laughs> I, was, right. I was looking around, and everybody was old, 10, 15 years older than me, and I was going, man, this could get sad, <laughs> you know. Uh, but there's more young talent here now than there has been in, in decades. Uh, it's, you know, Jason Isbell, they're not the young talent. They're, they're you know, they're a little older now. But Jason, yeah. the drive-by truckers, that whole group brought a whole other group behind them that, is, that has come along. And there's, uh, you know, Dylan LeBlanc, who's a, who's a young Americana artist, is doing, doing great. And there's a whole slew of young guys here that, uh, that it's, it makes it exciting again. Does Fame Records still exist? Not at the moment. Does it sound like you're <laughs> going to relaunch it? Uh, we are. We are. We're, we have plans to relaunch this year. Incredible. Fact, yeah. yeah. Congrats. Who's, who's going to be your first artist that you're going to put out? The first record we're going to do is going to be a 60th anniversary record, and it'll be a, a compilation of different artists doing Muscle Shoals Classic. You know, so we've got we've already got a track on Demi Lovato in the can, so we're uh, we're moving forward with that. 